said before, it's what our founding fathers did, it's what folks like Thomas Paine did with his common sense pamphlet. Uh, what happened in the American Revolution with the advent of the movable type printing press, the cheap means of production, more people were able uh, to spread the message, to get material and information out to the public. And it's even more so uh, the case today. I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was cutting off over there, so hopefully that doesn't become a, uh, a problem. It looks like part of our slide is not showing. Um, but with the advent of the internet today, there's nothing standing between you and your ability to get a message out online. This is not the era of broadcast media where you need to be a producer in a TV newsroom, a talk show radio host, or an editor of a newspaper to decide what information uh, got to the public. Each and every one of you has the tools right at your fingertips, virtually for free, if you have a computer and an internet connection, to make your voice heard and get it out to you know, so, so many people in your community, in your state, and all across the, uh, all across the country. So we're going to talk a little bit today about blogging, social media. I'm going to give an example of online video, which we're going to hear more in depth from on uh, Tracy later today in a presentation I'm very excited for. Uh, but please do chime in with your questions, and I'll try to delve a little bit more into the advanced stuff, but I want to cover some of the basic principles, because so oftentimes people get engaged in this, uh, and they're doing it just to do it, and, it, and that's important, and that's appreciated, but we want to make sure we're doing things as effectively as possible. So we'll talk about some of the underlying principles, uh, some examples of success, and then perhaps delve into a little bit more of the technical stuff and answer all of your questions. So again, is this effective? A lot of people always say, we're preaching to the choir, we're talking to ourselves, we're in a bubble, who really cares? I want to give a few examples, and I've already used the Dan Rather one, so I won't hop on that. The gentleman all the way on, on your right there is kind of cut off, but that's George Allen. How many of you know the name George Allen? George Allen is running for Senate in Virginia now to reclaim his former Senate seat. In um, 2006, he was then the senator from Virginia. Uh, he was considered to be a, a safe incumbent. Many political pundits said if he'd stayed in, uh, in bed for the entirety of the election, he would have won in a landslide. <gasps> Unfortunately, he didn't stay in bed. He got out, he campaigned, and uh, some left-wing trackers were egging him on, and he finally threw an insult at one of them, called him Makaka, which uh, folks on the left researched to, to find out it was an ancient Moroccan slur. And <laughs> he ended up narrowly losing his Senate seat by about 1,700 votes to the Democrat Jim Webb. Um, at the time, not only was he the uh, Republican senator from Virginia favored for re-election, he was also considered the front runner for the 2008 Republican presidential nomination. So not only did he lose his Senate seat, his presidential ambitions were dashed, as well because of this one YouTube moment that came to dominate the, uh, the entirety of the election coverage for the, for the last month or month and a half or so. Uh, to the left of him, Harriet Myers. How many of you remember Harriet Myers? One of President Bush's nominees for the Supreme Court. Um, as soon as he made the nomination, conservative bloggers got angry and they started saying, she has no proven track record, we don't know if she's ideologically with us, and they just beat up on her day after day after day. And eventually it became the news story um, that you know, conservatives are questioning her credentials and, and her ideology, and the Bush administration withdrew the nomination. Um, we've done Dan Rather, so we've all the way to the left. Trent Lott, how many of you know Trent Lott? Former Republican uh, Senate Majority Leader, speaking at then Senator Strom Thurmond's birthday party, said that you know, it would be a better country if he'd been elected president. Um, and he say he was just trying to offer kind words to a 90-something-year-old man. Folks on the left said that they were, he was endorsing Strom Thurmond's past uh, views on segregation. The story started off not in the mainstream media, it started off with liberal bloggers calling him a racist, calling out this story, and the story that first got traction in the mainstream media was liberal bloggers are basically throwing a hissy fit about what just happened, and then it snowballed from there. It essentially got to the point where 200 mainstream media reporters were camped out in front of his house, and Trent Lott was under lockdown until he finally stepped out to announce that he would step down as Senate Majority Leader and eventually uh, retire from, from the Senate. So don't discount yourselves. These, think of the huge impact of each and every one of these examples that I talked about and, and in the uh, previous slideshow as well. Folks like yourself can make a huge difference. The big thing is, don't be afraid to try it. Anything we talk about today, don't be afraid to go sign up for a blog. Don't be afraid to sign up for a Twitter account. Don't be afraid to sign up on Facebook. If it doesn't work out, you can shut down the account, cancel it, forget you ever did it. But the worst thing you can do is leave here today and not try any of this because the stakes are too high 
And if you don't do it, who else is? The people who are still at home in bed, people who are sitting at home watching TV, they're not gonna do it. If those of you in this room, if we wanna take back this state, if we wanna take back this country, it's so important that we all get involved and do everything we can. So now this is kind of focused on, on blogs and title of my side, but this is really uh, applicable to social media and every other effort that you do as well. A lot of people sign up for these things and they're outraged and they want to get involved and they want to make their voice heard and they want to vent and this is a great outlet for it. But try to do it in a way that's constructive. You know, if you're rehashing the talking points that you saw on Hannity or, or O'Reilly last night, there's so many people across the country already doing that. Find a way where your voice will have more power. And these are the areas that we really recommend that we think people can have the biggest impact. First and foremost, cover your local government. It was so encouraging to see the number of hands that went up when I said, how many of you attend local government meetings? But that's still not enough. You would be shocked at the number of local government meetings where there's not a single member of the public there, and there's not a single member of the media to pay attention to what's happening. I myself and was the dork in high school who was the student rep to the Board of Ed, and we would have these uh, debates at the end of the fiscal year of how can we spend all the money that's left over or they'll take it back. Not what do the kids need, what's going to help advance our cause, how can we get rid of this before they take it away? What's so wrong with returning that to the taxpayer? I thought it was outrageous, but there's not a single reporter there or a single member of the public to call them out on what was happening. So it was shocking to me when the following month the superintendent got up and proposed a massive budget increase. When the, the months prior meeting we were having this debate on how can we spend this money before they take it away. But now let's ask for more. I lived in a regional school district where there were four towns uh, combined into one high school. And so essentially the superintendent proposed a budget. They went to a referendum in the four towns. And then the PTA, which is like the grassroots arm of the superintendent, would send these handwritten letters to parents. My parents got one. You know, Dear Mark and Pauline, please make sure you turn out on you know, May 7th, because it always has to be a random day when nobody knows there's an election, uh, to vote for the school budget. Otherwise, Eric's not going to have a desk to sit at. He's not going to have textbooks. Um, you know, just these awful, awful lies. And they turn the parents out, they pass the budget, and they all get big fat salaries and benefits, and uh, you know, the, the student still sees very little of whatever uh, massive budget increases are flowing into these school systems. So I thought it was ridiculous. I told a, a few Republican town committees who then beat down four versions of the vote before they had to settle for a flatline increase, which was uh, still, I thought, too much. But this happens all the time. We don't read about these things in the paper until the story is budget referendum passes. Don't wait for it to be too late. Go to these meetings. Call these people out. One of my favorite bloggers is a guy named Bob Weeks in Wichita, Kansas. And he started a blog called Voice of Liberty in Wichita. And he did exactly that. He started showing up at local government meetings. He started filming them. And there's not a single member of the Wichita media there covering uh, these city council meetings, these zoning board meetings, these board of education meetings. But Bob was there, he was filming them, and he was blogging about them. He said that when he first started showing up, uh, the elected officials on these boards and commissions would show up in t-shirts and jeans, uh, and you know, they would Beyond what they were wearing, they would say the wrong things and they would vote the wrong way. Soon they knew they were being taped, they knew that they were being scrutinized, and they started showing up in suits and ties. The way they started talking about issues changed, and the way they started voting on issues changed as well. Bob started to get frustrated because, you know, this is a tiny blog in Wichita, he was only getting a couple hundred visitors a month. But before he threw in the towel, he decided, maybe I'll start an email newsletter, maybe that'll get my message out to more people. So he put a little sign-up form on his website saying, if you want my weekly newsletter, please, uh, please sign up here with your email address. And he started looking at the email addresses that were pouring in. And it was each and every one of the elected officials on those boards and commissions. It was the members of the local media who were supposed to be covering those meetings but weren't. You know, they were writing a report from the minutes or writing a report about the outcomes after it was too late, but they weren't actually there covering the meetings or asking the tough questions uh, that should be asked. But Bob was doing it, and he started realizing, wow, you know, I may only have a couple hundred visitors a month, but they're the right people. They're the people I'm influencing. They're the elected officials themselves, and they're the media that should be covering. So Bob has been making a huge impact, and it's so encouraging to see him do that. Our job is to get folks like you doing that in you know, every town and community here in Massachusetts and all across the country. Now, national issues, I know a lot of people get fired up about national issues, so that's, that's our second point. As I said, don't rehash the talking points you heard on TV last night. Think about how you can provide a unique perspective. Remember the earmarks debate, the bridge to nowhere, things of that nature? Earmarks were an issue that the public didn't really understand until they had tangible examples, until citizens went out and started taking pictures of things like that bridge to nowhere, started taking pictures of the Teapot Museum in South Carolina, started showing people what are earmarks? How are these actually wasteful? 
actually showing, putting a face on those projects. So find a way, whether it's a stimulus project or uh, you know, an example of uh, something uh, with Obamacare, how is that playing out in your state or local community? And put that angle on it in a way that's going to resonate uh, with the folks closest to you here in the state of Massachusetts. Or personalize the issue in terms of how it's impacting you and your family. What problems have you encountered with Obamacare? How has the government gotten between you and your doctor if you're a woman who's been denied a mammogram? Tell that story. This is an area where the left, I think, just dominates us all too often. They make it about the polar bears dying and, you know, as I said before, the kids sitting on the floor without textbooks. Well, we put up these great policy experts from think tanks who talk about leading economic indicators and the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial. At the end of the day, and public opinion research proves this, you can't persuade people with a logical argument unless you connect with them emotionally. So it's so important that we tell those personal stories because you need to make that emotional connection before logic will even get through to them. So we can win every argument, but we will lose every debate unless we do that. And that's why it's so important that each and every one of you personalize this. How is it impacting you? How is it impacting your family? How is it impacting your community? The other area is local, state, or national newspaper, and I shouldn't say paper, just media in general. But we talk about holding elected officials accountable. We need to hold the mainstream media accountable. It's not enough to beat up on the elected officials. Start calling reporters out by name. What are the stories that should be told that they're not telling? Of the stories that they are telling, what aspects are they ignoring? Call them out on their bias. Call them out on the, uh, on the issues that they're failing to cover and hold them more accountable, just like we hold our elected officials more accountable. And that's, at the end of the day, going to ensure that our citizens and the public all across the state, all across this country, are more informed and can make the right decisions when election day rolls around. Now, transitioning from uh, blogs for a moment to go a little, a little broader. Actually, I should go back for a moment because I like to give the example. So, in one of my failed attempts to explain to my parents what I do for a living, my dad said, this is great, you go around the country telling people they should start blogs, but who the heck has time for that? So I pulled up on my Blackberry about once or twice a week, my dad will send me these rants by email about this is happening in our town in the, as in, if I'm from Connecticut, where we have first selectmen instead of mayors. The first selectmen did this, and you know, the zoning board said this, and this is how it's impacting our business. And I said, look at this is great, you're sending this to me, and honestly, I'm not even reading it. But if you put this up on a blog, the people that you're complaining about will see it. They'll start paying attention. And other people in the community might as well, and you can actually make a difference. So one thing that's especially important is, you know, we all get fired up, we all rant. Put it in a place where it can be constructive. Call these people out by name, because almost every elected official or their staff has what's known as a Google News Alert. So anytime their name is mentioned, they're going to get an email saying, you were written about. And we all know, we talk about making phone calls or sending emails to our elected officials. If you don't know how a congressional office or a state legislative office operates, essentially, before they go cast a vote, they ask their staff, how many people have contacted us for or against this, and they get a tally. This, this many emails for, this many emails against, this many calls, this many calls against. Because there's so many groups on both the right and the left that are pushing calls, it essentially becomes a wash at the end of the day. Uh, but I'll tell you, elected, elected officials are often very vain, they're very thin-skinned. If you start writing about them, they're going to notice, they're going to pay attention. Most of them are doing their own social media. If you're tweeting about them and calling them out with a Twitter handle, if you're referencing them on Facebook, and if you're writing about them on blogs, they're going to see it, and it has 10 times the impact that any phone call or email ever can have. Because at the end of the day, they don't know how many blog visitors you have. They don't know what your reach is on, on social media. They can certainly see the number of followers you have, but if you get people starting to reach with that, you know, you may have 200 followers on Twitter, but if you call up six of your friends that you make here today and say, please retweet this, that they start seeing, oh my god, this person really has influence, you can really shape the way that, uh, that they act, behave, and vote, uh, both in politics and public policy. So I think that's incredibly important. The other thing that's really important to consider is, you know, again, the, the argument, this is great, aren't we preaching to the choir? Absolutely not, because you're building these networks, you don't even realize uh, the reach that they have, the fact that you may have 200 followers on Twitter, but each of those 200 followers may have 200 more, and each of their followers have 200 more. You're getting a message out to people in ways you don't even realize. Beyond that, the most important audience that we need to reach are those folks in the middle, the people who are informed and pay attention to what's going on, uh, but they're the more independent voters. But they decide on election day, they go to Google, and they start researching the candidates, they start researching issues like Obamacare, which, you know, where should I stand on this? It's so important that when they go to Google or any of those other search engines, you know, YouTube, for example, second largest search engine in the world. Most people don't know that. 
but that's why video content is so important, and I know Tracy will talk about that later. Uh, but Google or any search engine as well, when people go to that and, and search for information, it's important that, I mean, how many of you go to like the 12th, 15th page of results? None of you. How many go to the first or the second page? That's where most people go, so it's important that we get our information there. And this is what we call search engine optimization. Basically, the prominence of information is decided by the number of blogs writing about a given topic, the number of incoming and outgoing links to any post. So the more that each of you get engaged, the more that you link to one another and to other friendly media outlets, to good stories that advance our cause, the more people you're going to reach. So when they go to Google, those become the top 10 search results. This is another area where the left is absolutely killing us. And so it's so important that we get involved. Now, the other thing I see happening is you want to rant against some liberal, liberal blogger or call the New York Times out. Reference their article, quote it, don't link to it. Don't help them become more prominent. Link to ourselves, link to each other, link to our friendly allies, but don't do it to the left, or at least do it in very uh, limited ways. Uh, you know, use your discretion, don't, don't do it in a very freewheeling manner because you're just helping them become more prominent in search engine results. So I think that's the key. We're in the midst of an information war, and we want to get our message out to as many people as possible. We want to preach to the choir so that the choir can go sing that message to everybody who's not at church, and that's, and that's the goal, and these are the efforts through which you can achieve that. So let's talk briefly about social media, and I'll get the rundown. Facebook, you guys already raised your hands up here on there. MySpace, a lot of people always ask about MySpace. Unless you're a musician or a sex predator, you probably don't want to learn that. Because those are the only people who are left. LinkedIn, how many of you are on LinkedIn? LinkedIn's great for professional stuff. The other thing I'll say about any of these is create an account on as many as possible. Make sure you reserve your name. Because when we talked a minute ago about search engine optimization, as you become more prominent, as you become more involved, people are going to Google you. And in politics and in campaigns, they always say, define yourself before your opponent can define you. Do you want your opponents putting stuff that are going to dominate those top 10 search results, or do you want to define your own image? So even if you don't use these on a day-to-day -day basis, sign up for an account, put your positive message out there, get your bio, make sure people know who you are, um, and that will be great help. LinkedIn has a lot of great implications for professional and career-oriented stuff, not as many for political activism or citizen journalism. Uh, Twitter, we talked about, that's huge, and, and hopefully if I can wrap up, we'll go a little bit more in depth, because I think of how many of you are on Twitter again? So maybe close to half, so that might be something that's relevant for you guys. Uh, YouTube, a lot of people just think of this as online video, but it actually is a form of social media. I know Tracy will allude to that in a few moments. Flickr, how many of you have heard of Flickr? Flickr is like the YouTube of still pictures. And this is a really great resource. If you go to, I won't spend any time on it. Um, because it's really simple, go to flickr.com. The same with any of these, go to the website, sign up, try it out, if it's not for you, throw in the towel, call it a day. Uh, but Flickr I think is really powerful because we talked about the decline of mainstream media, reporters getting laid off. I think photojournalists are a realm that's been very hard hit. So when it comes to campaign rallies, tea party events, go out there, take the pictures and upload them. And I've been doing this for a few years and I'm amazed at the number of reporters and really you know, legitimate, high-profile media institutions that contact me and say, hey, we're writing a story about this, but we didn't have anybody there to photograph. Can we have permission to use your picture? So make sure that you're taking pictures. I think pictures tell powerful stories, and the more that we can get that out there, it can have a big impact. Yes, Rob? There's also a Creative Commons tab on Twitter, Twitter. So if you click that, people can use it without having to contact you to say, can you use it? So make sure that you click the Creative Commons tab, and that lets anybody else that's writing use your photo. Excellent. See, I always learn more about these things than I think I teach. But uh, I'll be able to do that and get less emails of reporters bugging me. Uh, Dig.com. How many of you have heard of Dig? This is social bookmarking, and there are various other, other things like this. But when you read a news article, um, you know, newspaper or national uh, news website, you'll often see these buttons. Tweet this, like this, dig this. Um, sign up for the accounts. Take the two seconds to click those buttons, because these social bookmarking websites, Millions of people actually go to these for their news each and every day. And it's basically socially moderated news. So the more people who click that button, the more prominent the story becomes. So don't do it for you know, the, the stories that we're trying to call out for bias or that we don't agree with. But take the two seconds to just click those buttons for the good stories that talk about waste, fraud, abuse in government, that hold our elected officials accountable, the instances where the mainstream media is actually doing their job. Make sure you use these simple tools to drive that up so that more people see it. The more people who vote, if we just get a few hundred people clicking those buttons every day, you're gonna reach thousands more uh, seeing those stories who wouldn't have otherwise. So I think those are really important. 
Wikipedia, most people don't think of this as social media, but it actually is. Each and every one of you has the ability to go sign up for a Wikipedia account and edit any entry. Now, I won't spend much time on this either because it's very, uh, very difficult. There's like a 70 page uh, guide of rules and, and things of that nature that you need to become familiar with. Uh, but for any of you interested in this, I'm happy to get on the phone with you. I'm happy to send you some resources to get involved because I actually think this is one of the most important realms, again, where the left is dominating us. And if you go for examples, uh, for example, look at Bill O'Reilly's uh, Wikipedia entry versus Keith Olbermann's. Bill O'Reilly, all of his controversies are front-loaded at the top because you know, all these people get these sprawling long entries and I don't know about you, I have ADD, I don't read past the first few paragraphs that I'm looking for something specific, but all of Keith Olbermann's negative stuff is buried at the bottom. It's subtle things like that. We, don't, we wouldn't encourage you to go on there and tell lies. All we have to do is tell the truth. But just the subtle ways that they're shaping information, I think Clarence Thomas, uh, the Supreme Court Justice, used to be described as an activist judge on his profile. Which of course, some left he went in there and made that subtle reference. At the same time, the media was beating him up for being an inactivist judge and not asking a question on the bench for two years in any oral cases. Um, it's amazing the way information is portrayed and the impact that can have, because Wikipedia is often the first, second, or third uh, return on any search engine result for a given issue. So if your state senator doesn't if your state senator doesn't have a Wikipedia entry, go make one. Go tell their voting record. Go tell you know the, the positives and the negatives about them. Make sure that the public is finding out that information because otherwise their campaign website is going to be the thing that pops up first. Where they're, you know, as we said before, either define your opponents or let them define themselves. Make sure that the public is getting the information they deserve, not the stories that the elected officials want told. And unfortunately, that's too often what the mainstream media is doing. They're writing down the quotes and shipping out the story because they're lazy or they don't have the resources, but the public isn't getting the information that they deserve. So I think Wikipedia is incredibly important. There are many, many other platforms. How many of you have heard of Pinterest? How many of you are on Pinterest? This is the most rapidly growing social media platform right now, and in actually really impressive ways, and I'll admit, I'm not as familiar with it. Um, unfortunately, my colleague Tabitha Hale couldn't be here to do this training today, and she does a great job with it. So if any of you are interested, we could host a webinar. Uh, the demographics wildly skew towards women. One of, one of my friends calls it the internet for ladies. Um, but it is rapidly growing. A lot of organizations are using it in great ways, and it's a, I think, a phenomenal way to, to connect, especially with female voters and, and members of the public. So I would encourage you all to check that out as well. If you want more information, I'm happy to set up a webinar or a conference call. Yes, sir? The name again? Pinterest, uh, P-I-N, now again, I always like to hammer this home because the biggest thing we see is people come here, come here to these events, they get revved up and they go home, and they don't do it because they say, you know, either I'm just one person, I can't make a difference, or it's that old example they used in one of my psychology classes in, in college, the example of uh, they conducted a test in an alley between two apartment buildings with a lot of people looking out the window, somebody was getting attacked, and everybody thought, everybody else is seeing what's happening, they'll call 911. Nobody called 911. Don't be those people sitting around waiting for somebody else to call 911. Pick up your phone and call 911, not literally, not right now, but by getting involved in these different platforms. Don't wait for somebody else because at the end of the day, like I said, it's those of you in this room will do it, and even that's not enough. So we need each and every one of you to do it, and we need you to get your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers uh, involved as well. But here are some examples of where it's made a huge impact, and I know I've already gone on and on with many examples, but these are very specific to social media. The offshore drilling debate back in 2008, um, Nancy Pelosi was trying to force a renewal of the moratorium on offshore drilling. Republicans were set to uh, push forward a vote that they had many Democrats on their side, uh, that would end the moratorium. So Nancy Pelosi shut down the Congress. She didn't allow the vote to happen. She turned off the lights, she turned off the C-SPAN cameras, and she sent everybody home. But Republicans stayed on the floor of the House of Representatives, and they continued to debate the issues. But of course, the C-SPAN camera wasn't there, and the lights weren't on, so who could see it? They started using Twitter, they started taking pictures, they started taking video themselves to push it out. And millions and millions of people across the country saw that, and it gained the attention of the mainstream media who started covering the issue, who forced Congress back into session to hold that vote, which lasted all of a few months before Obama came to office and renewed it through executive order. Um, but that made a huge impact. That reached millions of people and engaged citizens around this country to do exactly what I talked about before. We don't need MSNBC, we don't need CNN, we don't even need Fox News. If we build our own networks, 
person to person all across this country that allows us to get information out without the mainstream media. Uh, the 2008 election. How many of you remember in Philadelphia there were Black Panthers intimidating white voters? As I said before, the mainstream media is faced with a huge lack of resources, so it was actually some Tea Party activists who were doing poll watching who saw that happening and they took pictures and they put it on Twitter and a producer at Fox News saw it and he sent out a camera crew. We might never know about that story if those citizens hadn't been there using social media to call it out and I think that's a great, uh, a great story as well. Tea parties. How did this organic movement happen all across the country with millions of people? It was because of social media. People were using Facebook, they were using Twitter, they were using Google groups to communicate, to collaborate, uh, to plan and spur the launch of this whole movement. I think that's so impressive and that could have never happened in the age of you know, phone calls and phone trees and, and those sorts of things. Uh, I talked before about the Arab Spring and the Iranian elections. One twist on that that I think shows the, the power of social media, um, when all that was happening, when the Iranian authorities were cracking down on these pro-democracy uh, rallies, CNN was covering Lindsay Lohan and talking about celebrity news over the weekend. So people on uh, Twitter started using the hashtag CNN fail. And eventually like three million people used this hashtag and CNN immediately switched their coverage because they felt the pressure. As I said before, we can hold elected officials accountable, but we can also hold the media accountable as well. And these tools are an incredibly powerful way uh, to do that. I know Tracy's gonna delve more into online video later, but this is an example that I just love. A few years ago, and this is a former colleague of mine, Ed Frank. Now Ed had never shot, uh, a video for the internet before, he'd never uploaded anything to YouTube, he'd never edited a video. Um, so even though he was with Americans for Prosperity, which is a, a national prominent organization, he really did this as a citizen activist, and that's why I think it's such a powerful story. Everybody at our company who knew how to use a computer or knew anything about technology was on a plane on the way to an event, so Ed was really out on his own. But Ed was walking to work that day, and he walked by this hotel where he said, something's going on here, what is it? He started asking me around, and people said, well, Al Gore's inside. Al Gore was inside the building giving a speech on the virtues of environmentalism, how everybody should ride their bikes or walk to work and use public transportation. And this was in August. I don't know how many of you, how many of you have ever been to DC in August. Not a pretty place. It's in the 90s or 100 degrees, awful humidity, just disgusting. So you know, poor Al Gore didn't want to come out to a hot and muggy car, so he had a fleet of SUVs and town cars that were outside idling so that the air conditioning could run so that he could be comfortable <laughs> after he got done with the hypocrisy of his speech. So Ed just took out his cell phone, which had the ability, and most of you have a cell phone with the ability to capture video. And he took some quick video, and he went back to the office, and he used Windows Movie Maker, which is a free editing software that you probably don't even know, but each and every one of you has on a computer if you own a PC. I think it's iMovie on a Mac. Uh, but you already have free editing software. And Ed put together what was probably the crappiest video I've ever seen. <laughs> Not even kidding. Um, and he uploaded it to YouTube and he's really proud of himself because he figured it out. And within that one day, over 125,000 people, this is a screenshot from later that day, it was like after a few hours, 120,141 people had viewed it. He got invited on Fox News, they showed the video. He got invited on talk radio shows across the country, the newspapers were talking about it. It puts the environmentalist on a defensive posture for an entire news cycle, just because Ed happened to have his cell phone with him and walk by somewhere. Stuff like this happens everywhere. Maybe not to this scale, but stuff is happening in your local community. Stuff is happening at the state level. President Obama is coming to town for rallies. Uh, but even if it's your county council member, I mean, go on the internet and you'll see these viral videos that have happened from city council meetings, that have happened from state legislative hearings. Uh, make sure you film this stuff. It's actually, we were uh, very sad for the loss of Andrew Breitbart a few months ago, but I was once at a conference where he gave probably my favorite advice from, from him, which was, Film that bitch. You know, go everywhere and film it because other people aren't. Make sure you're capturing what's happening and telling that story because, as I said before, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. And video tells a powerful story. You don't need to be a citizen journalist who goes and you know, writes four blog posts a day if you go out and you get that one video clip that can change things. And we talked before about Bob Etheridge from North Carolina, who just because a couple of college students went up and asked him questions and he put them in a stranglehold, he's now former Congressman Bob Etheridge. So this stuff really is changing the political landscape and we hope you all get involved. Yes, sir. Is there any chance you can regulate the air conditioning? Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe Tracy can, can check on that. Are we too cold or too hot? We're frozen. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll see, we'll see if we get that taken care of. All right, so going back to the, the principles of making this effective, and again, I know a lot of people are getting involved, but always take a step back and think of the big picture stuff of, am I actually being effective? And we all mock President Obama for being a community organizer, but I think these are the principles that have actually served him so well. People talked in 2008 about how uh, the internet was a driving force behind his victory, and I think it's because he and his campaign got how to use it as community organizers. And that's the same mentality we need to bring to the table. These aren't tools where you blast a message out. This isn't the age of broadcast media where you use it as another venue to just push information at people. What makes the internet unique is that you yourselves are drawn to it because it's a way to make your voice heard. So you need to remember to listen. And that's one of the principles here, listening. Because your followers want engagement. It's not just about throwing information at people, it's about having a conversation with them. And that means listening to them as much as it is talking to them. So get to know these people, interact with them, and listen to what they have to say. And I promise you, when it comes to Twitter, when it comes to Facebook, and every other social media platform, it's going to make you hands down uh, more effective at it. And you may say, well, what does that matter? I'm listening to them. Trust me, when you start to engage people, they'll start to promote you more. It's going to make sure that you get more followers, that you're uh, getting a bigger reach. So at the end of the day, it really does benefit you in the cause that you're trying to advance. And that goes to relationship building, which is the second point. Uh, the other point there is to challenge. And that's something that I think is so important because you know, we, we sometimes laugh at people who set out these lofty goals. When uh, Senator Kennedy passed away and a friend of mine said, we're going to get Scott Brown elected to the Senate, I thought, he's delusional. But look what happened. If we didn't have people like him who stood out there and set these lofty goals and inspired other people to step up to the plate to help achieve them, we would never achieve anything at all. And I think that was the case in uh, 2010 as well, in January, when people started saying, we're going to sweep control of the Congress. People said, yeah, that, that would be nice. Maybe, maybe we'll increase the number of seats we get, but we won't actually win. And look what happened. We need those people out there. We need people like yourselves to encourage other people to step up the plate, uh, step up to the plate and, uh, and achieve greater things. Action is the next principles. Don't just, com uh, don't just complain to people. Don't just encourage them to vent. Give them things to do. I'm angry at so-and-so. Here's their phone number. Call them. Tell them they voted the wrong way. Or tell them they need to vote this way on an upcoming bill. Give people action items, because so many of the people who are following you are willing to do things, they just need to be given things to do. People don't instinctively wake up and say, here are 20 ways I can make an impact today. But if you give them those ways, they'll actually do it. Something that was frustrating to me when I started in politics, I uh, said to somebody uh, who was our fundraiser for the organization I worked for at the time, this online stuff is so important, why don't donors give money for it? And I said, Eric, donors don't just wake up in the morning and say, here are all the things I can give money to, you've got to go sell them on it. You've got to go convince them to write that check. And I think those principles of fundraising apply to activism as well. People will do things if you make the case and you give them the things to do. Evaluation and reflection are the next two, and I think those really tie together. Always take a step back and say, is what I'm doing effective? Is it making a difference? How could I be more effective? And make sure you take the time to reflect on that so that you can hone and improve your efforts over time. And then finally, celebration. When you do achieve big victories, and when you do it through empowering other people to join you, make sure you take the time to thank them. Make sure you take the time to celebrate those achievements, otherwise we'll become dejected and we won't be uh, fired up for the next fight. And I think this comes, uh, comes into play with elected officials too. We often beat them up, and members of the media also. We often beat them up for the things that they don't do or the things they do wrong. When they do something right, tell them they did something right, because they need to know that when they make the right decision, when they make a tough call, people have their backs. You know, we may beat them up for flip-flopping on a position, but if they change to take the right position, make sure you thank them, uh, because otherwise they'll never do it again. And at the end of the day, we care about making an impact, so I think that's so important. So I think these are the principles when you step back and think at the 30,000-foot level, uh, how can I be more effective? Think like a community organizer. Now, we'll go into questions, and if I can fire up the internet a little bit of time, we'll, we'll delve into Twitter and maybe some other things. But again, the biggest question I get is, do I have time? This sounds like a big endeavor. And that goes back to what we talked about with information activism. Maybe you don't have time, but think of the things that you can do. And then let us know so that we can connect you with other people who can do the rest so that together we can achieve something. Maybe you don't have time to start a blog on your own, but look around. If the three of you in this room band together, that lightens the load for each of you, and you're still getting a message out, and you're still making an impact. I think some of the most effective blogs out there are collaborative blogs that have multiple contributors. Or if you don't have time to do that, be a commenter. When you're reading your local newspaper's website, comment on the story. Comment on the blog post. 
take the second to put up a link on Twitter or Facebook and help that search engine result so that that post becomes more prominent uh, for those independent voters that we talked about who are looking for that information. Think of a lot of little things you can do. Take those two seconds to click the social bookmarking websites to help push that information out. Don't just be the information gatherers, which is really important uh, and, and is our goal for each of you, but be the information distributors. Help us build that nationwide network so that we can get a message out uh, as powerfully or more powerfully than the mainstream media. The other question I get quite often, which I'll just uh, bring up, are the legal implications. Can I get sued? I read a lot about bloggers getting sued. You can, and it's something that we absolutely encourage you to be aware and informed about. Um, unfortunately, our lawyers told me I have to stop giving legal advice since I'm not a lawyer, but it was fun while it lasted. Um, <laughs> but I would, I would encourage each of you to go to the uh, I think it's Electronic Freedom Foundation, EFF.org. And they've got a great legal resource guide for bloggers. It tells you what you need to be aware of, what are the pitfalls to avoid, and I mean, I can't tell you that if you follow all these, you might get sued, but I would say if you do things the right way, you're going to be protected. And there are a lot of organizations out there who are going to have your back if something does happen. And even liberal leading groups like the ACLU have actually provided legal defense for bloggers because they believe in free speech and they believe in the rights of each and every one of you uh, to assert your First Amendment rights uh, to be a reporter. And so those are kind of two common questions I get. I'm going to see if I can fire up the internet here, if I can get my mind by. Um, and then we'll go over a little bit on Twitter, but while I do that, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have. I forgot to mention uh, a couple things that Rob Eno, the, the blogger here from Red Mask Group, sent. If you are on Twitter and you're tweeting about today, we're using the hashtag WatchdogMA, WatchdogMA, uh, to talk about today's event. So if you're tweeting about it, please use the hashtag. Please encourage other people out there uh, to get involved. There are a few other, and I'll, I'll save these hashtags that he sent for other things until when I get Twitter up so I can explain what it is. But with that, while I'm trying to connect to the internet, I'll take questions. Yes, sir? I know uh, you mentioned no, no legal advice, which is probably a smart thing. Is there a resource, or are you aware of anything in regard to not just blogging, but also videotaping? And part of the group that part of what we want to do is perfectly mm -hmm. appropriate to it is uh, is ask well-researched questions about candidates, regardless of their party, yep. film them answering it, and then putting it on YouTube. And part of our concern is that can we is that. Can, can they go after us for that, which I'm sure anybody can do yeah, it. Yeah, definitely be aware of the, the laws when it comes to recording uh, either video or audio over the phone or in person. I'm not sure what those are here in, uh, in Massachusetts, but uh, I would look up state law or, or Google that and find a legitimate resource where you can find out uh, if it's one party consent or if you need the consent of the others that you're taking. Two, party. Two, party. Two party. Okay, so don't film other people without their permission. <laughs> so, we were with a group last night, we were, trying, we're all newly on Twitter trying to figure this out. And we're looking at things, and all you see is this group of symbols. We have no clue what that means. We don't, I mean, it's clear, like Wall Street Journal, I know what you mean, that sort of a thing to retweet. But all these things that, all these... The number side? Well, numbers, and, and that's all there is. Yeah, those are hashtags. Cool. I'm going to pull up Twitter here, so we'll talk about that in a moment. So bear with me. And if your question doesn't get answered at the end of that, please, uh, please bring it back up. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was on the AOL, and uh, there was an article, and I made what I thought was a very mild uh, uh, objection to it, uh, given all of these uh, previous uh, uh, comments that were all in favor of it. And they shut me down. And it was not obscene, it wasn't anything. It was just a very mild political objection. Subversive. What's that about? <laughs> so sorry, you were commenting on somebody else's site? No, on a news, uh, news article. On a news article? Yeah, where they have all these comments. Yeah, I would find a way to then call them out if they, they'll, they'll oftentimes have terms of use. So, you know, obviously if you use a curse word or something like that, or anything like yeah, that. But, but if they're shutting you down and you're not doing that, if you're not violating their community standards, then call them out because then they're selectively censoring things and, and they shouldn't do that. So that's a, a great reason to, you know, as I said before, don't just hold elected account, officials accountable, hold the media accountable. If they're censoring the voice of citizens and favoring one viewpoint over another, call them out on that. And I think uh, that's something that I've seen happen before and even you know, folks on the right and the left will come together to call to call those outlets out because it's a mainstream media institution 
Uh, certainly, folks believe in, in free speech on, on both sides, so I think that sounds particularly egregious. I'm happy to talk to you afterward to figure out other things we can do, but find ways to call that out yourself or contact people like uh, Rob here, who has an established blog who can uh, beat up on them, and, and I think at the end of the day, they'll, they'll often cave if, they're, if, in fact, what they're doing is not appropriate. Um, yes, sir? Uh, just a quick comment. Um, just when you, uh, regarding like, the news articles and the comments, just be aware that there's what they call trolls on the internet are trolling. These are people that specifically will comment on certain news stories and make inflammatory and insightful comments to try to generate a negative feedback to that article and try to get people away from the main point of the article and to fo uh, focus on arguing with that person that made that controversial comment on the website. So. Uh, just a suggestion, just ignore those, stick to the main topic of the article, because if we respond to them, they're just getting empowered, so just, just be aware of something. Help feed the trolls. Help feed the trolls. Yes. <laughs> it's like they say about uh, was it wrestling with pigs, if you get down the mud and wrestle with a pig, he enjoys it, and you get dirty, don't waste your, don't waste your time. Uh, any other, other questions? Yes, sir. You know, our goal at the end of the day is to cultivate as many people who are citizen journalists as possible, so I think it's really important to be objective, to be fair, to call that other side uh, for a quote. You know, basically take a look at this, oh, where is it? the handbook, and it, and it talks about these things. What are the basic journalistic principles that you can follow to be most effective? Opinion is important, but distinguish it. Say, this is an editorial and this is opinion. Uh, but at the end of the day, we think you can be most effective by, establish, by establishing yourself as credible. You, know, you can certainly have perspective or point of view that you cover news from. You know, the Franklin Center, we have a network of professional reporters. We say we cover things through a free market lens or from a taxpayer perspective. Uh, but be fair. Use these principles if you actually want your phone calls to get returned, if you actually want people to pay attention to you. Um, otherwise, they'll just accuse you of being a partisan, a partisan hack. But that doesn't mean you can't put up an opinion post. Just make sure to say, you know, this is the editorial or opinion section of the website. This is not the, the other. Uh, Trust of the efforts that I'm engaged in. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, your comment that, that uh, news media will, will use Google Alerts and pay twice as much attention to that as uh, uh, you're nagging them or sending press releases or what have you. My question is to what extent should you, in fact, try to communicate directly to reporters that should be, you know, maybe reporting or giving more priority to conservative? Sure, I think that's an important thing to mention that I, that I didn't bring up before, but um, make your own little press list. Whether you're covering a certain topic or a certain locality, make a little directory of the names, email addresses, and phone numbers of the reporters who cover that beat. Start calling them, start emailing them, start giving them a heads up on your stories, because what I've seen in so many cases across this country are people who start off as bloggers who then become the go-to source when that reporter needs a quote from the other side. Or they've been approached by newspapers to start their own column, or they've been given their own a radio show. You do not need to be a PR expert to promote your own work, to connect with reporters and get them to cover it. And you don't need to go to journalism school to be a citizen journalist. So these are all things that you can do uh, that other media outlets do. Don't be afraid to pick up that phone and call those reporters. Oftentimes, you know, these guys are lazy, they're starving for content. If you hand them a story, they're going to credit your blog for breaking it, and they're going to push it out to a whole platform and universe of people that you wouldn't have reached otherwise. Yes, Rob? Another thing that they really like I'm going to do Twitter really quick, take a few more questions, and I want to make sure we get to, uh, to Trent to give him enough time because he is one of the, or one of my favorite presentations out there, and I think something that's going to be valuable for all of you. This is Twitter. I'm signing to my account. Go sign up. It takes two seconds. You shouldn't hit any roadblocks. If you do, I'm going to put up my email address, and you can, uh, you can call or, or email our staff, and I'll, either myself or one of our interns will help walk you through it, and that goes for Twitter, YouTube, anything at all. The other thing I'm going to mention quickly before we get about YouTube, if there's ever something you want to learn how to do, whether it's I'm studying for a blog account and I can't figure out how, or I want to uh, you know, do XYZ on the sidebar, you know, things of that nature, I'm having trouble signing up for Facebook, go to YouTube and type in how do I, and then insert what you want to do. I swear to God there's a video for everything. How do I upload a YouTube video? YouTube has made their own videos on how to create a YouTube account, how to upload a video, 
And then citizens out there have done uh, videos on pretty much every other topic, walking you through actually recording their screens as they do it and narrating for you what exactly to do. Not just for online stuff as well. How do I tie a bow tie? There's one for that. I'm ashamed to admit this is a grown man, but I couldn't figure out the instruction manual for my car when I had to change the headlights, so I said, how do I change headlights and put in the model of my car? There's a great video that walked me through it. So uh, there's some great resources out there. Use YouTube as a tool. Always call us or email us if you need help, but try finding it on YouTube first, and if you can, we're there to help. But this is Twitter, and as one of my friends says, you know, once you take too much time for the account, it's typing in a box. If you can type in a box, you can do Twitter. Now, Twitter is unique to call it microblogging because it's 140 characters or less. It's actually modeled off the length of what used to be uh, the defined length of a text message. So it's about brief, it's about rap rapid response, it's about engagement and conversations. It's actually a lot of fun. And as I said before, you'll connect with those people who you may use preaching to the fire, but you'll also connect with prominent bloggers. You'll connect with members of the media. Uh, one of the very first times I trained on Twitter, a woman named Melissa Clothier, who was a stay-at-home mom with four kids in Texas, started it. She now has 25,000 followers on Twitter. She's got Jonah Goldberg and, and all these other you know, well-established conservative authors and commentators, and mainstream media reporters as well, paying attention to what she says. Uh, a buddy of mine works for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who I always call a squish and, and a rhino, and I'll make fun of him on Twitter, and he always says, like, you always have to go after my boss, don't you? You know, David, I'm, I'm just joking with you, I'm just giving you a hard time. He said, yeah, but then Melissa retweets you and I get yelled at by my boss. And People are paying attention to what folks say on Twitter. People on Capitol Hill, people here in the state legislature, people in your local communities, all across the country, reporters as well. Yes, ma'am. Do you care who's following you? Do you want the left to be following you? Oh, yeah, and then always assume anything you do is going to be seen by your opponents anyway. So don't let them pull you down into a fight and, and fight an issue on their turf. Keep charging ahead with, with your message, but if they're following you, great. If conservatives are following you, great. If liberals are, if members of the media, if elected officials, the more uh, the more the better. If, yes, you, if you close yourself, especially if you're in a public role, it becomes a story that just happened to Elizabeth Warren's press secretary who closed her Twitter account and someone found out about it and she had some pretty somewhat borderline racist tweets in there and it became a national story and it became a story in the press. So just keep it open. Don't put anything on Twitter you wouldn't be comfortable with being on the front page of the Boston Globe yeah. and an attack piece on you. So always, always kind of use that as your benchmark for what's appropriate. I was actually going to say the exact same thing. Twitter is by definition a highly public quote. So anything you're putting out on Twitter is terrible and seen. And sometimes you don't even realize. I mean, I've done stuff that's probably borderline inappropriate, not in a, in a way that's egregious, but certainly could make my employers unhappy, and it's ended up on. National blogs, pictures of us, and stuff. Not anything embarrassing, but just you know, funny, snarky stuff. So always assume that that could happen. Now again, if you can type in a box, you can do Twitter. So when you log in, and I've got some great resources on this, we can send around as well. I want to go through really quickly so we can get to trend. Um, you pop up, you get this box where you can type your message. So you can uh, type anything out. 140 characters isn't much. You can put a link in there, and it will truncate it so it doesn't take up many of your characters. But you can steer people to read the whole story on a blog or or on a website. Now, as we talked about before, there are different characters. So if I were tweeting about today, I would say, great crowd at watchdog MA. So this is the hashtag that Rob sent around that we're going to use. It's basically the pound sign. This is what we call a hashtag. Now, there are people that will follow you on Twitter so that they see every tweet you put out. There are other people that only care about certain issues. So there was a debate last night in Texas in the Senate primary. People used pound T-E-X-S-E-N, Texas Senate. So anybody who cared about that debate could follow all of the tweets that everybody on Twitter was saying about that topic, even if they didn't follow the individual users who were putting them out. So there's a topic you care about, and there are a few that I'll read aloud here that are relevant to Massachusetts. So basically, if somebody's not following me today, but they know about our event and they want to follow all the tweets from it, they can go, and in this little search bar up there, they can put the pound sign, Watchdog MA, and they can just see every tweet coming in from every user on Twitter covering that topic. Now here in Massachusetts, the prominent ones are M-A-P-O-L-I, P -O -L -I, hashtag M-A-P-O-L-I, and that's all things uh, in Massachusetts politics. Hashtag M-A-S-E-N, and that's for all the things in the Massachusetts Senate race with Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown. M-A-S-E-N, the abbreviation for Senate. 
Now, for any congressional race, it's hashtag MA and then the congressional district number. So if it's how many districts do you have? You have nine. So if it's MA3, which is the Golden Weaver Songus district, it's pound MA03. So MA0. And then the number of the district. There are several localities and towns that uh, Rob has mentioned to me here as well that I have been following. So if it's Boston, it's pound B O S P O L I, B O S P O L I. And then if it's just about Boston in general, pound Boston, pound Lowell, pound Worcester. Um, and you can always ask on Twitter, what's the hashtag for? You know, these things pop up organically. So if you don't know it, ask it. You know, email Rob. They'll probably know. Connect with him on Twitter. He can tell you. Um, yes, Is there a directory of these no. hashtags? There, there really aren't. Is it they, organic? It's, it's it kind of organic, so, I mean, there's some, like, like, those just mentioned are probably mainstays. You could probably find those referred to on, on blogs. But a lot of them change very quickly. A lot of them become humorous. Like yesterday, President Obama announced when you get married, rather than registering for gifts, register to donate to my campaign. Um, <laughs> folks had a field day. I saw the hashtag on Twitter, pound Obama fundraising ideas, and it was, well, instead of donating that kidney, <laughs> And uh, when, of course, he went after Romney for putting that poor dog on the roof of his car, and then folks found that uh, Obama had eaten dog meat as a child. There were pound dog recipes. Um, <laughs> some interesting uh, things there. So they're often humorous. They often happen organically and very quickly. But always, you can ask somebody more established on Twitter. Just tweet them and say, hey, what's the hashtag for? Or you know, email one of us, and we can help you track it down. Um, so if I wanted to tweet and use the hashtag, that's what I'd do. Now, my Twitter handle is Blame Telford. So if you want to follow me, it's Blame Telford. B-L-A-M-E-T-E-L-F-O-R-D. Now, if I wanted to reference myself in a tweet, which I wouldn't, I would do this you know, pretending I'm somebody else and I, want to, um, and I want to call them out and I want to make sure that they see it. I would put the at sign, like you put in an email, at. And then I would put Blame Telford. Now that's basically, it'll link it to myself so that I can check anybody who's referenced my name in a tweet, whether I follow them or not. So it's kind of like a hashtag, but to a specific person. It's your username, and it's tagging that username in a tweet. So if I want, depending on somebody else, and I want Eric Telford to see this, that's what I'm gonna, uh, that's what I'm gonna do to ensure that it comes in his feed of people who've replied to him or referenced him. So those are the two things you typically see, the hashtag and the at sign. We're really close on time, so I want to wrap it up. I'm happy to go more in depth. I'm happy to hop on the phone with any of you who are signing up or wanting to learn more. I'm sure folks like Rob and others here in the state who are engaged would be happy to, uh, to help you as well. But I think Twitter is one of the most powerful tools out there. For years, the left was um, claiming victory in the online sphere, saying they were ahead of us. This is one realm where folks on the center right are definitely far, far ahead. Actually, a few months before the Anthony Weiner case broke, there's a story in a newspaper in D.C. It's called The Hill. It's a Capitol Hill news publication. And it said, liberals have found um, the new key to victory, Twitter. And they're going to invest a lot to overtake the right on Twitter. Of course, a couple months later, it led to them actually losing the congressional seat, which I thought was kind of humorous. Uh, but it really is a powerful tool, and I hope you all get engaged with it, as well as everything else I talked about. With that, I'm going to wrap it up. I'll be around all day, so if you have questions, please feel free to come up and, and chat with me.